Thank you for joining us today. My name is Livy Issa. I'm co-chair of Student Voices for Refugees Steering Committee, and I'm so excited to be here with Erin Fitzgerald from the Scholarship for Syrian and International Students Impacted by International Crises. Erin, would you mind giving us a brief overview of your program? Yes, um, thank you, Olivia. So I'm Erin Fitzgerald, and my official title at my university is the Director of International Programs. So, you know, my first job is uh, overseeing international student services, um, study abroad programs, and on-campus internationalization and fellowships that are international. Um, so I have sort of a wide portfolio of things that I do, but one of the most important projects to me since 2012 has been our engagement with the Syria Consortium for Higher Education, which was an initiative that I connected with at the Institute of International Education in New York at a sort of small conference in, in March of that uh, 2012. And so we've been involved at our university in hosting students who have been impacted, whose education or education access has been impacted by the crisis in Syria um, mm -hmm. since 2012. And then roughly in 2019, we expanded um, our definition of who could be considered for this um, scholarship that we offer at, Sal at Salve Regina um, to include other students, um, other international students um, of, of really any immigration type that had had their education impacted by a crisis in their um, country or region. So we've expanded it slightly. And then um, just a note that we are a small um, Catholic institution that will come up in my comments, about 2000 under, undergrads, a couple hundred graduate students located in Newport, um, Rhode Island. Excellent, thank you for that overview. And that's good to know that history of um, sort of where thoughts on this started and then in 2019 that shift. Is there anything specific that impacted that shift or you felt like it was just time to expand? Well, yeah, I wanna make sure I get this right though um, because I may have the exact timing of it wrong, but what we were having, we were struggling first of all because of um, the current or the prior administration's limitations on students accessing the student visa. So while we had displaced Syrian students already in the US in various, either in refugee status or temporary protected status, who could apply for the scholarship? We um, saw a, a sort of precarious drop off of students who would be able to come from where they were, where, whether they had been displaced to Turkey or Jordan or were displaced internally in Syria due to the inability to get the student visa. So we just wanted to make sure that actually the Star scholarship could be utilized. So that was one thought. And then there were um, advocates on campus that said, we will certainly say Yemen, say, um, you know, plenty of other places, Venezuela, uh, plenty of other displaced students. So I think that that kind of went into the um, philosophy, but first it was driven by a practical problem with the um, accessing the student visa to avail themselves of the scholarship. That absolutely makes sense. And I think um, I've heard that from a couple of different programs that that was a turning point. So thank you. Yeah that outline. Um, and to get into our questions, um, I'd love to hear how your scholarships are financed um, and whether that's more of like a private sponsorship or something that you work out with the university. What does that look like? Okay, so this is driven entirely in our case by the university. So uh, when I first came back from IIE and learned about the consortium and you know this need, I actually just sat down with our president directly, who was a sister of mercy. This is the order, the founding order for this Catholic institution. And she um, was a very sort of practical, practical, accessible person. And, on, and so I had a fairly easy job in convincing her. Uh, she saw that this aligned directly with our mission. And she simply said, I feel we can sponsor up to four students at any given time. And I'd like you to try to bring in, you know, one to two a year each fall and then sort of sustain at that number supporting so that there'd be a population of four on campus at any time that we were supporting and as they graduated. So now it seems to be kind of the way that we're bringing in two a, two a year. Um, and usually have four to five here at, an, at any um, 
point in time. But yes, to sticking with the financial question. So the university simply um, sort of gives them a full tuition and fees scholarship. I think the fees is an important point because at many universities, the fees add up to a substantial um, insurmountable sum. So these students have a status that no other student on campus has. Maybe there's a handful of students who have full tuition scholarships, but they, all, they have to pay their fees. This is a full tuition um, scholarship and fees. And it's considered you know, to be within our sort of, if you know the term discounting, it's a, it's a university discount taken on by the institution. That's remarkable that your president was just like, let's let's figure out how to do this. Um, I'm sure that is not as easily done as it was said. I think you're right because it's um, we're we're small, and I think small institutions sometimes have that um, benefit of being a little bit more nimble. We don't always have the same type of financial resources as the big schools with endowments. But she's at the time. You know, she's our former president. She retired. Um, but she said something which I think is a useful phrase for all university administrators, and that was actually incrementally, it doesn't cost us more to have one additional student in the classes, in our activities, in our programs. So if you look at it that way, um, it's it, you know, if you take it that view as an administrator, it's different. But on, on the flip side of that, the admissions people, the financial people, they are concerned with discounts. So when you have, you've given somebody a full discount, it factors into all these other calculations yeah. that um, become a little bit um, like a barrier for, for some administrators to get over. That's gonna impact our discount rate. You know, <laughs> that's the phrase that you'll hear. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I wonder, and this might not be something that you have, perspective on, but I wonder if there was pushback from like a board or um, how back and forths went. <laughs> um, I, my understanding from her is that that's why we ended up with the number four. They, you know, when she brought it to her cabinet, that's what, you know, a small group with, which would include the chief financial officer and the chief enrollment management person. Um, who then report to the board that they felt for our institution to have this four at any given time that, you know, in addition to other scholarship programs across the institution, that this would be sustainable for us. Yeah. Um, and I think the note was, if we wanted to expand beyond that, to go to your earlier point, we would need to find some form of external sponsorship. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of sustain that scholarship. But this one is one where the, the university is, is taking on that discount itself. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And that touches on what my next question was um, about sustainability. This seems like so long as the administration is on board, this is a sustainable program, but have there been many challenges to maybe less financially, but more like admission staff feeling burnt out or um, program programs shifting when you decided to to seek out different applicant pools. Um, what has the sustainability of this program looked like, and do you foresee any problems or changes in the, in the near future? Well, um, I think what's helped us, and this has changed over the course of um, well, we're going getting close to ten years now, um, has been the outside organizations that have drawn students to the scholarship. So that's been different in different years. So early in the Syria Consortium, the Institute of International Education was posting the scholarships. They would receive the applications and kind of do a little matching. Um, then they stepped out. That was helpful, um, but then they stepped out and then the application started coming directly to us. And other organizations kind of popped up and played a role there. And I would highlight right now, if we look in recent years, um, this Syrian Youth Empowerment Group, you're familiar with them. So they seem to kind of know about our scholarship and then they'll kind of, um, we'll see candidates in the pool that they've assisted through the process. That's helpful because we're just a small school in Newport. So getting the word out about the scholarship is, is sort of work that has to be done and it's hard for us to do it alone. I would also say, again, IIE has organized the peer platform where they're posting all these scholarships and 
Um, we I try to keep our information up to date. So getting the opportunity out there, and I think I could probably do a little bit more in the local regional refugee um, services to to make them aware of the scholarship, so that we get applications that are both um, from uh, you know from outside the country, but also people who are already here and need access to education. So that's something I have my eye on. Um, in terms of the question about admissions, there again, I think that's where um, I've taken a different tact. We do it ourselves. So the students have to apply to the university. So um, that's, you know, they apply. But in terms of the scholarship, they also, um, they just work directly with me and my team in my office. So the admissions team doesn't have any additional burden. Um, so if they encounter an applicant and they're looking at the applicant and they say, okay, the applicant's struggling to get transcripts, then it comes over to me. And then we work um, with the student. So it's kind of, I think this is something, an underlying message somebody needs to want to do most of the project. <laughs> you know, you have to have um, student and students and staff on the campus that feel committed to it and that aren't just you know like you said you're asking admissions to do double the work or make special exceptions i think somebody needs to be at the helm i definitely recognize that sometimes these things do fall to one or two really <laughs> really motivated people so kudos to you for being a really motivated person on your campus but i'm sure that's that can be a lot because that you know i'm sure your program does get a lot of excitement from people. So to, you probably do have a lot of applications to look through and um, that's interesting. I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper on that application process. So applicants apply to the university and then they apply to your scholarship directly. And then if the um, admissions team sees a student who has disrupted education, they direct them to you. And then I just actually wrote, I turned it in last night, I wrote a research paper on for one of my classes on alternative options to transcripts because those are not always uh, attainable. What does that, do you have a standard process for looking? Well, I'm definitely, I'm gonna be candid, not standard. And it's really shifted over the years. Here again, we have to rely on outside people in the early, actually, from 2012 to probably 2015, the students were sending everything directly to me and they didn't go through the Common App because our feeling was like this Common App was just so unwieldy for, for the student. Um, and so I, so I want to be clear, a student could still do that. They could kind of essentially submit everything to me, um, the administrator of the scholarship. And, and if I looked at it and I thought, okay, we're, um, I can kind of get it through the admissions process on my end without the student having a lot of um, labor. Or it, just as you so nicely said, it could come through admissions. They notice it's a student who's had their education impacted by crisis and they bring it to me. So they're still coming in from both avenues. But early on, we really, um, because focusing on Syria, we really worked with Education USA so Education USA, um, you know, they, their person in Syria was not operating out of Syria for um, during this time period, but from elsewhere and was able to kind of understand was the institution open? Could we get a transcript? Was it not open? What were the other options? Um, so they really were able to um, assist us or if we had the um, part of a transcript, it, it so we were relying on other people to place where the student was academically but i have to say we have never gone wrong every single one of these students has done well academically here we've never sort of you know and i think there's always this idea oh, we're going to let somebody in the back door who doesn't actually hasn't actually gone to high school it never happens i mean as far as i can see the students are either overqualified or perfectly qualified i just um so that's where i think it takes it does take a little bit of um open-mindedness though, um, and trust the admissions department, trust this department, they're not, they don't, they're not scrutinizing, you know, us in that way, if that makes sense. Um, again, that's the advantage of a small institution. State schools might have very, have a harder time, I think. How big is the undergraduate side? Um, 2000 undergraduates, another three or 400 graduate students. 
that's why when I think about, I'm getting off track, but when I think about sort of this, the projects that the higher education complementary pathways and the new things that uh, may be happening in the next uh, four to 10 years, I think the small um, Catholic or small religious institutions are places of opportunity um, in, in this respect, because it's, you know, I'm not, you know, a diehard Catholic by any means. I'm not a practicing Catholic. There are a lot of non-Catholics and non-religious people here on campus, but the missions of these institutions match very closely. And they are small and they are nimble and they're able to operate a little bit. Yes, I appreciate you pointing that out because I think I am very hyper-focused on my context at, at a yeah. 7,000 undergrad school or, or I, you know, think of where other other programs have developed like this. And yeah. I think it's easy to forget how impactful the student size can be and, and the mission mm -hmm. of the university um, and school. So I appreciate you saying that. Just from your experiences, um, less on the administrative side, I wonder how the student reception is to these, these students or to this program because it is an aligned with the school's mission. And I'd hope that that also means that that, that aligns with general student population values. Has there been any like student pushback to this? Program? There's never been any student pushback that I am aware of um, to the program or any anybody administratively, faculty, staff, or student questioning what, what we're doing. Sometimes I think we have, we were very lucky with our first um, candidate that we brought to campus. He's just one of those people that, um, I think it was like, like a, a kind of links people together. Like everybody knew who he was, who he was and uh, everybody was very enthusiastic about him. He connected to all kinds of different people on campus. And I, he was here for you know four years early in the project. And then the other students who came after him had similar attributes, but particularly him. And I feel that um, people could see how we were benefiting from having him here on campus. Now, all that being said, we are not a very particularly diverse campus. So it's a mission for the institution. It's a goal of the institution to diversify in every possible way, domestically, internationally, um, you know, uh, we're very female heavy. I mean, we have a lot of work on that and it just, you know, sheer quantifying, you know, having more people from diverse backgrounds on campus. So, <laughs> I really give these students the benefit, you know, just I admire them because they came into what is really a homogenous population and had to navigate it. So I don't want to sugarcoat it and say it was probably it wasn't difficult for them. Um, but that we I didn't notice any, you know, um, intentional questioning of the program or their being here. Not not that I'm aware of, but like any campus, we will have our our issues, I think. Oh, oh, of course. Yeah, like you said, any campus will have those issues, but that's great to hear that that, that was such a great reception. And um, I, yeah, I do wonder one quick follow up to that is, is there any student involvement in your programming? I think I love student leadership. I'm very into student leadership on this campus and thinking about like trying to raise awareness about refugee issues on campus. Is there that kind of thing at the university? Yeah, I, I'm gonna say that's an area that, that I would say is a weakness uh, on my part, meaning that we, and I see like, if we were gonna go down the road, which I'm, I'm really looking at, so I'm interested in all the work that you're doing and that UARM is doing, and then the counterpart in Canada, I'm, I'm really looking at, and I see, especially in Canada, how the, the students have driven it. Um, and student fees, it's student fee driven, and student engagement, students helping. Um, so I'd say it's not really a pro like it's not a program here to have the students involved, and so that's something I, I need to do. Now, having said that, I'm going to just probably you now say that on the other hand, all the work that we do in this office, we have you know international student mentors that you know handle international orientation in general. We have global student ambassadors that come back from study abroad. The two groups work together. So there are students engaged, but not specifically charged with assisting with this scholarship program. Does that make sense? Now, oddly, almost every single one, yes, every single one of these scholarship recipients, not by design, have 
served as an international student mentor. So they, after being year to year, they would then take part in the next orientation, do you know? And that's a little bit, and I'm getting off track here, Olivia, so just feel free to cut me off. But one of the things I did in the program, I don't, it's not required, but I, if they wanna work in my office when they come, they have a job in the office. Some of them have need, needed to have that documented prior to coming to certify financial ability to kind of fix that gap a little bit. So they would maybe work in our office, um, say anywhere from 10 to 20 hours a week. Most of, the, our app, most of our recipients have been on F1 student visas. And then some of them uh, went to TPS and were able to work more on, on campus. But at any rate, if they were working in my office, that was sort of my way of ensuring that they were connecting with the other student mentors, the other student workers. Um, so that it's a little bit of it, but it's not really what you're talking about in terms of sort of the students at the leading, which I think would be great. No, I think that's great though, that the students are so excited about the program that they're ready to enter mentorship roles. I think that's like a great testament to the environment that you're cultivating. And I also, I do, do want to make sure, I think one of your last questions was about, you know, strategies for advocating for these programs. Let's absolutely go to that one if you're, if you're up for it. Okay. Yeah. I was saying actually one of my colleagues at, um, IIE asked me to go co-present with another university at South by Southwest on the topic of the Syria consortium. It's like a like a, a couple of years in reporting out, and so my section was, you know, how do you advocate? How do you advocate? How do you sort of convince the university leadership? And so what I wanted to just focus on is I think when students or um, staff are starting or developing these programs that they can strategically focus on institutional benefits. Like, of course, we start with the, you know, the, the, the moral obligation to the student themselves, right? To, you know, opening the opportunity to the student. But unfortunately, um, within the university context, most university leadership also wants to hear um, like a cost benefit analysis. I, I'm, I'm spending or I'm not collecting tuition. Please tell me what we're going to get out of it. So of course we can focus on the student first and that story is important, but the other institutional benefits that I've kind of realized over time is um, the ability to embody the mission. So if our mission, if we're Sisters of Mercy mission and our critical concerns are immigration, access to education, women, then these students actually like embody the mission, you know, in a, in a really real way. Um, from their time through and what they accomplish after they graduate. And I think it's a way to kind of publicly sort of um, embody our, our mission. And then the diversity issue we already touched upon. Yeah, you're going to bring more diverse students to your campus. This helps. Um, and then maybe not so obvious that somehow sometimes these projects and this, you know, feels a little weird to say this, but it does draw attention to the institution in positive ways that allow us to showcase our mission. So our first student, I don't know why, but all the things he was like on the cover of, you know, the Providence Journal and it was in the Washington Post. He's, show, he's just showing up in all these places because of his accomplishments. Um, and it sort of allows, again, it's sort of public relations, you know, like the public relations of assisting uh, displaced students is important, especially when your mission says that you know you are focused on social justice and so forth. And then and, and the last one is the cross campus um, sort of connections that this kind of project, you know we I hate this word, but we we tend to work in our silos and we all have our areas of responsibility. But this kind of a project, you have to work with you know everybody. Residential life, or the dining hall gave our students jobs in the summer. The library gave our our students jobs in the summer so that they could live on campus for free in in, in the summer. Um, you know everybody. You know the transportation team or the bookstore was giving. You know we had credit cards for books. I mean just you know what I mean like people chipping in from all kinds of different areas and um, and then feeling connected to each other around this, uh, this project. And then um, the best benefit is the students themselves. I mean, our students have done so well. They've gone on to really great graduate programs, are coming back and working in this 
in this kind of field. Um, and, you know, and that's just a great graduate. So it's a great graduate who can be invited back to campus to talk about uh, their work. And so I think anyway, back to the point is that be ready when, when going to ask for something in to be able to articulate um, the benefits to the institution and the university community, in addition to the student um, and their family and the, that we're helping through these processes. That's what I, I, I wanted to say. I love that point. That's something that I personally have just been starting to try and broach as I attempt to approach my university of like, what, how do I sell this as beneficial without it feeling surface level, because this is not a surface level program and it would require a lot of, you know, energy, but it has so many payoffs. Um, and so to be able to, yeah, articulate those has been great. Of all of those points, I'm just personally curious if there's any benefit that surprised you. Um, I, yeah, I, I suppose maybe that did surprise me as to how like successful they would be because I think before the first one came, I was like, okay, so geez, I mean, come, this, this particular student was coming from a really terrible, you know, very recent, very recent lived experience of very violent, and violent um, setting. And I thought we're gonna have to have um, just more forms of assistance to help them uh, navigate the US higher education. But it seemed like actually our regular systems, our regular supports for any international student, any domestic student, were able to be leveraged. Like we didn't need, I think we didn't need to do as much as we thought to intervene or support. We had to be ready. I don't mean to say that, but they, they, and they didn't seem to, um, they seemed to get here, really want to do well and did do well and asked for what they needed and just, um, were a great pleasure to have here. I, I forgot one strategic argument too that would be a good one to have ready if it's relevant. And that is what I remember in my first conversation with the president saying, we work with IIE, our institution. So if, and, and let's say IIE administrates the Fulbright or um, the Gilman scholarships, study abroad scholarships and fellowships and, um, or just like so many programs that, that they administrate for the US government. And we, the university are beneficiaries of a lot of these programs. And so in this case, they said, here's a program where we want you to cost share. We want you, the institution to cost share. And so my, when I, I said to my, our president, we can't only engage with IIE, with the programs where we're going to be receiving the, yeah the financial benefit or, or the, the qualitative benefit, the Fulbright language teaching assistant. We have to also be able to step up and participate in the part of the pie that's about us bearing the cost. So you can't have it both ways. You have to play, be a part of it all. And actually, I think she thought that was fairly convincing. You know, So it's another one to have in your back pocket. When you look at international students, um, in, you know, if you're talking to an enrollment management person, there's this group that's gonna pay full tuition. There's this group that's going to get merit scholarships. There's a group that needs full financial support, just like in the domestic realm. And this is that piece and they should be ready to, to support it. Absolutely. I love that logic. <laughs> um, I think that makes, that makes so much sense. I have one last question sort of on the other end, we've talked a lot about applications to this program, but on the other end of it, of graduating, I know that it can be concerning for students, particularly of refugee or displacement backgrounds in terms of like legal status and things like you need employment <laughs> out right, yeah. out, right out of college. Um, has there been any particular support that you've felt has been needed for, for student recipients of this program or it's another thing that was just built into the international student or already um, on campus career support um, provided to students that like met those needs or were there specific? I think that, no, we do. I think we, in, in particular cases, uh, we really did have to assist and kind of um, relax some of our policies such as um, you could still stay on campus and work in the summer, even though you had graduated, no other students are able to have that, you know, 
because we knew they needed some roof, not all of them, between when they graduated and when they were starting their graduate program or while they were seeking, um, because again, they were on an F1 student visa, their optional pr practical training. Most of our students have kind of realized early on that graduate school would be the safest next best step because it, you've had a little bit of uh, grace period in between. Um, so uh, what we were, I mean, the students on their own, I, I don't think I did a lot here, you know, found um, like the program at Columbia that uh, one of them won one of those scholarships and found graduate level um, scholarships that were similar in, in intent to what they had here at Salve Regina. So um, what we needed to do was help them on that next step. But we are, we have a student right now though, it's, it's bringing up an interesting case who's who's accepted to graduate schools and is wrestling with the, you know, how, with the deposit, <laughs> how to finance it. So we're, you know, we try and look for what are all the ex external opportunities, but I think you've hit on something here. Graduation's a tough point. Summers are difficult. Summers need to be think thought about logistically for these students. Um, we're lucky many universities, if you work on campus in the summer, you can eat and live on campus free. In the summer and that seems to be you know but you need to have somebody who ensures they get a job um, so there's that and I, I haven't also I'm going off on a tangent but I, I haven't yet expressed that the hardest part of this project is the room and board the other costs that aren't covered and trying student by student to cobble that together through their family resources through IIE emergency funds through private sponsors through outside scholarships. That's um, the hardest part of the project. And, and I really wish we had just some massive corporate sponsor that can sponsor that part of it and partner with the universities because most universities, even if they got over the bridge of full tuition and fees, our institution still is not like, that's, that's more clearly lost like lost revenue, you know, where they, without an endowment, they struggle with saying, I'm going to give full tuition and fees and room and board. And that would be my wish. If we could fix anything in my program, it would be that because we've always managed it. We always make it work, but it's month by month, week by week time, you know, student by student trying to finagle that, you know. That absolutely makes sense. And that's unfortunate that that's the case. Um, yeah. But it's impressive that you've been able to, to work <laughs> on a case by case basis, but um, that makes sense that that would be a big challenge. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm so happy I'm hearing about all, all this, uh, this initiative. It's really, really very great from perspective, like you're talking about private private universities, which I think are the small, the, the, there are like a big source to tap in when we talk about small colleges, liberal art colleges. As you mentioned, they can leverage their resources much better than big universities or state universities. And yeah, I just wanted to make sure. So when you, when you offer the scholarship, you just say it is the fees and the tuition is covered, but like, like within the scholarship itself, it doesn't say housing and maybe offering job on campus. It, it right. So usually, once we've gotten to this, well, if I if I post mm -hmm. it up on say the peer platform, it, uh -huh. it should say the other costs are. And I, I always feel bad about that because let's say it says seventeen thousand. You know, not to pay on day one, but over the course of the year. I think some students won't apply because they will not see any hope. It's way too large an amount. So how have yeah. we managed that? Well, in our first year with our very first student, IIE had um, these scholarships, so so they were giving them out, and I can't even remember the amount now. Let's say they were fifteen, eighteen thousand. So in, in several of the years, the student came in having more than the first year of, of money already from IIE. And so they could at least be here a year and a half and then we figured it out from, from there. Um, but you really, you, you've really hit on the, the main problem in, my, in, in our model that I see that's different mm -hmm. in Canada and, and could be different if we have a higher education complementary pathway for refugees would have to be different. 
you know some of these yeah. students have come with you know a couple thousand dollars but nobody had what it would take to pay on campus room and board insurance and books and i'm just thinking like maybe private uh, partnership with certain corporates might be a solution here like to get yeah. some corporates who think that this is part of their corporate social responsibility getting some uh, publi uh, public uh, publicity so it yeah. might be a first to tap in in this case but like yeah it's great that you just started and you make it happen another question so the IIE has to choose the students they used to do that um not now not not for this um program well, because I have some students who reach out to ERM and they really have a good like they really looks great their applications and I promise I would join them with any scholarship initiative that I found so I might have to start <laughs> just yeah. sending you some from other universities who are participating so that's really great thank you you're welcome <laughs> thank you so much it's so inspiring and um, motivating to hear how much you've been able to accomplish 